I would like to uh, start by welcoming you all and thanking you for being here. And, and I would like to say that I think democratic theory is really important for Chile's current challenges to deepen our democracy, which has important flaws, I think, derived partly from the legacy of institutions that we have inherited from the dictatorship. And so I think this is a really timely um, discussion we're going to have here. Uh, we have Hélène Landemore, who is Associate Professor of Political and Science at Yale University. She works on democratic theory, political epistemology, theories of justice, the philosophy of social sciences, particularly economics, constitutional processes and theories, and workplace democracy. Her work reflects on the shortcomings of contemporary re representative democracy and its oligarchic tendencies, and how to build alternative, more inclusive and truly democratic, deliberative, plural decision making. So I think uh, this is a um, very timely discussion. She is the author of several books, uh, Hume, Probabilité, Choix Raisonnable, a book written in French, and then by Princeton University Press in 2013, Democratic Reason, Politics, Collective Intelligence, and the Rule of the Many. This is a project um, to establish a theory of democracy based on the collective intelligence generated by the inclusion of citizens who have different ideas. We have seen how deliberation among equal thinking people lead to um, the polarization of ideas instead of, uh, of uh, this collective intelligence, which needs pluralism. She's working on a new book uh, that we will all be waiting for called Open Democracy, Reinventing Popular Rule for the 21st Century, where she theorizes an alternative to representative democracy on the basis of concrete examples of participatory and deliberative democratic innovations. She's also co-editor with John Elster of Collective Wisdom, Principles and Mechanism by Cambridge University Press, 2012, and is currently working on a project on digital technology and democratic theory. She has several awards that you can look in, uh, in this uh, spreadsheet, in this paper. Uh, she has published in the most prestigious um, journals of political theory. So I really want to thank Flaxo Chile Tribu and Congreso del Futuro for this opportunity to have this conversation with a great scholar that has developed ideas that I think are key to Chile's current problems. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much for the very generous introduction. <clears throat> so I, in the last few days I, I presented on my current work, my this current book I'm working on, this concept of uh, open democracy. I thought in this particular context, um, I would focus really on the more empirical part of my work, which was this uh, research I've done on Iceland. Um, because I was told that in Chile, you, you started a constitutional process that aimed to have participatory dimensions. Um, I hear that the participatory dimension is closed now, it's over. Uh, but maybe you could reopen it. And so I'm, I'm here to give you a model of how it's been done in Iceland that, that I don't know, useful or um, generate some 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 fruitful uh, some fruitful conversations so so can you hear me well is that working well yeah so I'm going to give you the story of Iceland and why I think it's uh, uniquely uh, uh, inclusive and participatory and transparent in, it, in its design uh, of, for a for a constitution making process so Iceland in uh, 2008, 2008 went through a massive financial and economic crisis. You may have read that in the news. It burned seven times its GDP over the course of a few months. So catastrophic, uh, cata cataclysmic crisis that uh, basically caused uh, people to protest and overthrow their governments in, in very Iceland Icelandic fashion, meaning not through violent means, but by um, banging pots and pans in front of parliament and uh, throwing uh, fruit and yogurt at the wall. Uh, so that's how they do revolution uh, over there. Uh, and uh, so it worked. They had a new government who said, OK, we've been promising you for years a new constitution to replace the old one that they got uh, in 1944 when they gained their independence from Denmark. So they said, OK, now is the time. We need to finally take the time to sit down and write a new constitution that's genuinely Icelandic and not just a copy paste from an old Danish document and reflect modern values and who we are as a people in the 21st century. So it's okay, let's do that. Um, but instead of appointing, uh, appointing 
you know, group of select uh, politicians or experts and letting them write that behind closed doors the way it's usually done, uh, they engage in a really innovative process that's marked by what I see as three key democratic innovations. Uh, the first was the National Forum, 2010, so I'll explain shortly what that was. The second one was the, the design for the Constitutional Council, which worked over four months to actually write the proposal. And finally, the phase that uh, was widely advertised around the world, so the, this, this phase of crowdsourcing for ideas. Uh, by opening up the process to people on the internet. So let me go over each of these uh, dimensions. So first, the National Forum. So the National Forum was basically a group of 950 quasi-randomly uh, selected citizens that were gathered for a day in a physical space to come up with a list of values and uh, principles that they wanted to see entrenched in the Constitution. So it was a kind of agenda-setting function. So among the ideas that were put on the table were the idea of a collective ownership of natural resources um, in reaction to the fact that in the 1980s, a group of fishermen had become filthy rich by exploiting for free the fishing grounds of Iceland. And that, that, that was seen as massively unfair to the rest of the country. So they said, okay, now we have to say that we own whatever is not already owned. And when people want to use the fishing ground, they have to pay a rent. They have to pay a fee to the public. Uh, they also got the idea of the right for information, uh, a number of things that came up and were listed in a, in, in, a, in a report that was then transmitted to the assembly. Then the assembly was also very interesting because um, it was a classically elected assembly of 25 constitution makers, if you will, but the pool from which it was selected was really um, different, I would say. First, by law, they excluded all political um, officials and professional politicians from, uh, from running. Um, so they encouraged ordinary citizens to run for this uh, election, and about 522 ran, said they wanted to do it at least, and ran a brief campaign. So the, the difficulty, of course, was that it was the first time anything like that had been attempted. I don't know of any, you know, uh, election where you have like 522 candidates. The, the media didn't know how to cover that many candidates and that many, you know, profiles and, and views and, and policy platforms. So so it was difficult. But then 25 were ultimately elected. The 25 you see on this uh, on this picture, so it's actually a little bit more complicated uh, because, in fact, um, the Supreme Court struck down the elections for very tiny irregularities in the shape of the ballot. So, anyway, so they, they had to reappoint individually each elected person, but uh, so it, it turned into, uh, it turned from an assembly into a council. So it, shows you that there were some glitches in the process. But in the end, uh, that's who uh, the, the people who, who uh, got in, into this uh, council. And so it included 10 women out of 25, a farmer, a union representative, um, a student, number of academics, including uh, two mathematicians, an economist, a political scientist. There was also a pastor, uh, the, the head of a video game company, uh, Really a di diverse set of, of people. Uh, you also see visually on the, on the front row, you have a severely disabled individual who is uh, Freya Harald Zotir, who also is a famous human rights lawyer in, in Iceland. It's an extremely different type of uh, constitution, constitutional assembly. The third interesting aspect was the crowdsourcing phase. So those 25 said, we're not going to write this behind closed doors. This is the 21st century. We have social media at our disposal. Let's connect with the larger public and gather, you know, information and, and, and suggestions and ideas that we maybe be will be able to integrate into the draft. And of course, you might ask, ah, oh, this is a recipe for disaster, right? I mean, we know what people do online and the, the kind of comments you generate. But it turns out it was remarkably productive. Not many people participated, but those who participated were engaged and thoughtful. And so among the contribution that, that, that proved useful was, for example, uh, a post that was made on Facebook by someone who said, we need to have a right to the internet entrench in the constitution because look at what Mubarak is doing in Egypt. You know, he was, at the time you may remember, it was 2011, he was turning off the internet in response to the, what's, known, what's now known as the Arab Spring. So somebody 
thoughtfully said, well, maybe we should prevent that from happening, yeah, it's not, even though it's unlikely, but you know, still interesting idea. Other ideas were to restructure the the proposal so that um, the people's rights came first. In the current constitution, the one that's still in place, actually, the, the one that dates back to 1944, the people's rights are last, and the president's rights are first. And the people on the, on, online say, no, this is a democratic society. We want the people's rights first, and the president's rights last. Um, they also got ideas for a better formulations for transgender's rights, uh, for transgender people's rights, for uh, children's rights. Um, and all in all, about 10% of the contribution that were made online made a causal difference to the final text. This has been measured by, by, by a political scientist. So this is what the process looked like as a whole. Started with this national forum. I should say, by the way, that this national forum, to me, what's interesting about it, it's not so much the format, actually. Um, the format is very interesting, but the, the, where the idea came from, it actually came from civil society. In 2009, so a year before this official national forum, a group of entrepreneurs and civil society activists that had, had on their own organized exactly this format, this national forum, it was called National Forum 2009, to talk about the crisis and, and what to do about it. And it had been such a success in the media, among the, 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 the population, that government said, well, we have to do it again with an official stamp and to start the constitutional process. Then it went to this constitutional assembly, which is in fact a council um, of 25 elected non-professional politicians who put their drafts uh, online, so in, in a succession of 12 iterations, starting with just the headers, the, the, the titles of each section, Right, that's when they reorganized the structure. Then they filled in the, the, the text a little bit more, got more feedback, then polished, polished, polished 12 times, back and forth, um, until they got happy with the results or ran out of time, more likely. Uh, they had only three months plus one month extension, which they used. And then uh, it took a while, but uh, government finally put it to a referendum, a referendum that was meant to be advisory. And for which two thirds of the voting population uh, approved of, of, of the, the proposal as the basis for a new constitution. During this referendum, they were also asked, I think, about eight questions about controversial aspects of the draft. For example, the Article 34, which is very controversial, about collective ownership of natural resources that are not already privately owned. It generated a lot of backlash, especially among, uh, unsurprisingly, the fishermen who didn't want to pay for something they had been exploiting for free for years. So, you know, that was like the, the party of the, of the uh, center right, I mean, the, the, the liberals, they're called over there, uh, just really didn't want this article to be implemented as such. They wanted to tweak the phrasing, et cetera, to make sure they had the best deal. And somehow, when it, when it so, so, the parliament thought, okay, we need to have a question about that article, that article because it's generating a lot of a lot of controversy. 85% of the voters said, absolutely, we want this article. So on some issues, this was solved very clearly. The one where that is a bit more unclear was about the status of the evangelical Lutheran church. So Iceland, like the rest of Scandinavia, is really moving towards a de-establishment um, of existing national churches, right? So it's, seen, it's, it's seen as more and more uncomfortable in a sort of even in Iceland, which is still pretty homogeneous, you get this trend of multiculturalism and there are religious groups that feel somewhat oppressed by the official status of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. So they've, they've been thinking for years about how to make that less problematic. So there was a proposal in the, in the constitutional proposal to rephrase the article about uh, the national church in a way that worked better. And that, you know, the, the referendum results were um, a little bit ambiguous on that, partly because of the phrasing of the question. Uh, so anyway, so but all in all, two thirds of the voting population approved of the proposal and approved all the articles, perhaps not so much the, the, the one on the, the, the church. Then, um, and then, and then nothing happened because the, the bill went to parliament and they found a way not to vote on it on a technicality. I think uh, because between the, the first parliament that initiated the, the process and that final parliament that approved it, uh, there, there had been an election and basically the people who had been kicked out of power came back. 
the economy had recovered, the IMF had been sort of helping Iceland recover, they, they didn't pay their debts to England and the Netherlands, so they were doing fine. And so the same people came back to power and they had no interest in this um, in this process, so they killed it. Uh, that's, that's my reading at this point. But for our purposes, it doesn't really matter whether it succeeded or not, although it does matter a bit because you don't want to replicate the failure. You would want to replicate the successful feature. So it's important to also understand what worked and what didn't. But, but from a theoretical point of view for me, uh, what's interesting is that it really shattered a set of theoretical um, prejudices, really, we had about the ideal shape of a constitutional process. And in the, the, the classic vision, for example, of somebody like Jan Elster, um, the, the ideal of a, of a constitutional process is one that is our glass sheet, meaning widely consultative at the beginning, widely consultative at the end, but kind of like, uh, you know, restricted, exclusionary, and, and uh, a bit secret in the middle, because, uh, you know, based on the study of the Philadelphia Convention, the, 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 the constitutional assemblies in France in the 18th century, scholars have come to the conclusion that the, the writing part of the constitution needs to be insulated from popular pressures, that this doesn't end well. You know, if you, if you involve the people at that stage, you will end up with dangerous ideas or you, you will harm the quality of the deliberation among the drafters because they, 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 they will feel obliged to grandstand and and they won't be able to change their minds, et cetera, et cetera. And so it seems to me like the, the Icelandic case is, is proving, is falsifying that, that theory because it shows that you can get, you know, a perfectly um, functional deliberation among the people and among the, the members of the group, even when they are somewhat scrutinized by the larger public, um, and you still get a very decent draft. So I'm actually not going to go into the, the demonstrating the quality of the draft. I, I encourage you to check it out for yourself online. It exists in a translation. Um, I've written an entire paper comparing that uh, crowdsourced draft, if you will, with experts' drafts written at exactly the same time by seven people, uh, very select, very, you know, PhDs and constitutional scholars, all that, um, who basically offered a blueprint to this group, to this council of 25. They were very much hoping that the council would just like say, oh, it's brilliant, we're just gonna you know, ratify it. They ignored those blueprints and they, wrote, they went off and wrote their own. But it's really interesting to compare the expert drafts. There are, there are two, they offered two. One more liberal, one more conservative, I, I, I would say. With this uh, proposal written by the 25 in collaboration with the crowds, you know, and and it's not that the, the crowdsourced draft is massively better, it's only, in my view, marginally better, but sufficiently so that it proves two things. One, people that are relatively amateur politicians can write very good uh, constitutions. And two, and, and, and what they do is, is marginally better than even what experts can, can achieve. So there are lots of caveats, you know, like the comparisons in this is not pure, it's not a, it's a quasi-natural experiment, if you will, but it's not a pure experiment. So set of incentives for the group of experts and the people who are different, et cetera, et cetera. But I still think it's a, it's a really uh, interesting result. Okay, so um, I just want to, to, to sort, of, uh, sort of theorize just a little bit now uh, about this process. To me, the, the inclusiveness of this particular process was achieved three, through several means. One, the openness of the process. Two, the descriptive representativeness, the fact that um, there was a, a sample of the population at the beginning that served as agenda setter and a group of 25 that wasn't perfectly statistically descriptive because they were elected, but still look way more like the people than uh, your classical Philadelphia Convention. Um, and then the last one is transparency, the fact that there was a lot of really uh, opportunities for the public to, to see what was going on. So again, clear contrast with this model uh, between this model and, and what we are used, the imagery of what a constitutional process looks like, which is a Philadelphia Convention of 1787 in the US, where you basically have those 55 um, white men from the socioeconomic elites, some of them slave owners, who wrote the entire social contract of an entire country for the next uh, 250 years, and no one knows, I mean, now we have historians who you know, tell us, but at the time, no one had any clue what they did, what they thought, how they reasoned, what went into the process. So, uh, 
okay, you might say, well, that's the hard secrecy because the 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 you know because of technological constraints. But in fact, the main reason was really a choice to insulate deliberations from outside passions and pressure. As I said, that's what uh, Elster really has, has, has uh, written about the idea that when you're not exposed to the public, you can change your mind. You're not, you, you don't have to dumb uh, dumb ideas uh, down, etc. Et <clears throat> Um, so what was the, so just to emphasize the transparent aspect of the Icelandic process, what facilitated it is definitely technology. Technology really helps. Because they, there was an internet streaming of the meeting of the National Forum. Those, those 950 who met were also um, under the public eye. If you wanted, you could watch. Maybe it looked boring, or maybe it was just hard to follow, but at least you could have a, a sort of access to, to what was going on. There was a form of vertical, what I call vertical transparency, in the sense that uh, you could, uh, if you're a member of the of the public, you could uh, access the drafts of those 25. Uh, you could exchange emails. You could ask for reasons. So one limitation of that model is that uh, because it was a little bit improvised, they didn't plan for all the, the logistic that goes into conversing with the public. So I think it would have been very, very time consuming if you had answered every single email, every single Facebook post. But you could imagine um, a, a process where, where you would do that because you would have the proper staff, proper amount of time, proper amount of technological support and all that. The other dimension was the horizontal transparency, the fact that uh, participants on this uh, on these online platforms, so whether the, the website that the, the council had or Facebook could read each other comments. So they could get a sense of, oh, what are other people thinking? And they could even fight with each other about fight, exchange arguments and deliberate. So this facilitated also a certain amount of, uh, this, 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 this transparency facilitated a certain amount of public deliberation. So that has led uh, one of the members, who is a, bit, is a bit biased, of course, I mean, he was the chair of the, the council of 25, but. The way this is it is that um, this is the first time the constitution is being drafted basically on the internet. The public sees the constitution come into being before their eyes. This is very different from old times where constitution makers sometimes find it better to find themselves a remote spot out of sight, out of touch. But when he says old times, I'm tempted to say that this is not so, there are less old times and we're still doing this. Like the constitutional, the constitutional treatises for Europe, for example, were completely opaque. We, I mean, it's, it's even hard to figure out from the Wikipedia page who was involved in the writing, who is who is responsible for all this, you know, for this 300-page um, uh, monstrosity. <laughs> um, so, so why did they choose the transparency, for example, in Iceland? They chose the transparency because of the technology. The technology was there. They thought, why not? Right? They also chose it as an anti-corruption device. In the light of, uh, in, in the wake of uh, the 2008 crisis, they felt like this was a, an accountability mechanism that they needed. They needed to know what was going on. So the principle of light as the best disinfectant. So it's not to say that the, the process was perfect. Uh, I, you know, I, 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 there are many things that went wrong and were not perfect and, and uh, sort of deviated from the ideal. When it comes to transparency, you didn't have, when it came to the process itself, there is very little clarity uh, about why a certain time frame was chosen, why a certain uh, setup or uh, you know uh, number of procedural steps were taken, uh, and so maybe you know for an iteration of that model, you'd have to think about how to make that more clear and more transparent. On the substance itself, um, you don't. You, you, it's true that they, they were putting their drafts online uh, once every week over the course of 12 weeks or, or so, but the meetings in between were not open to the public and they were not streamed either. So there's an amount of opacity there that, that, um, that we made. So could we imagine something more transparent? Um, so you could have a streaming of the Constitutional Council rather than delayed disclosure of PDF transcript, for example. You could have more media coverage, coverage and critical analysis of meetings. Uh, the media was just, I think in Iceland, the media was just paralyzed. They just didn't know what to do with this, so they didn't do much. Plus, they, most of them are owned by the oligarchs, so they also didn't have much of an interest in covering to some respect. Uh, and you could imagine doing it as a, as a more fully crowdsourced process, for example, having 
people um, maybe writing entire articles on a wiki or something like that. Um, might be too pushing it too far, but uh, we just don't know whether what, what will happen. So on the other hand, uh, there is a sense in which transparency needs to be managed. I mean, to me, it's not an absolute value. It's just an instrumental one. And it's true that selective disclosure of information might be more efficient than instant access to every stage of the process because watching streaming debates, etc., it's, it's just too much to ask from, from regular citizens. And only, only a few would be really interested. Um, and there are some theoretical problems that remain and that, that we haven't solved, which are how do we um, adjudicate between these conflicting authorities, right? Um, what's more legitimate? Transparent debates among a self-selected crowd or opaque debates among elected few, right? So that's what usually the, the advocates of secrecy will tell you, that while well, those people were elected, they, they, that's what they're here for. Why should they all of a sudden be accountable to yet another um, subgroup, which is self-selected online? Uh, so I'll just end with some questions. Um, why did the experiment fail? So it failed partly because of design problems. I think they, they didn't uh, perhaps put enough um, thought and energy and, and money into the whole thing, and so they lost in legitimacy as a result. Uh, they, they might have lost the public in the process. It took, it took a long time, etc. It also failed for political reasons. I genuinely think that uh, you know the, the, the political parties just found a way to, to just like ignore the whole thing because it was not uh, aligned with their self-interest. There are also questions about the so, so the question for you would be if you were to attempt or re-attempt something like that. Um, how do you make sure you keep the elite, the parties, and the existing system on board, right? As opposed to alienate them, which which the Icelanders very much did. I mean, the, the very gesture of excluding politicians from the pool of candidates, for example, that was definitely a declaration of war. So maybe not do that, for example. Uh, I do believe that actually among the elected elites, among the parties, the politicians, there are lots of you know people of goodwill who really genuinely want to change the system. I just don't know how. So you need to find those. And, and basically help, uh, ask them for help. Uh, then there's the question of the scalability of the Icelandic experiment to a larger country like yours, right? Like we're talking 235,000 people here. So if it didn't work there, how is it going to work here, for example? Well, I think that all the democratic innovation that I've shown you scale. You can do a random sample of, of people at any scale. You can do crowdsourcing at any scale just have to have maybe more technological support. Um, Egypt did it in 2012. They also had a constitutional process, which also failed. And they had this crowdsourcing phase, and they got 65,000 comments. They didn't use them because they didn't know how to. But again, put money, put engineers, put technical people, I'm sure this can be sort of automatically sort of aggregated or sorted out. or It's just a matter of will, I think, at this point. Um, there's a deeper question, which is, okay, but maybe Iceland is very homogeneous. So you get a sort of consensual culture that's very conducive to these kind of processes, but you couldn't do it in a more divided society. And again, I don't know how um, Chile sees itself, whether it, you know, as a homogeneous or divided country, but I honestly think we don't know. We don't know if this could work elsewhere, and so it would be worth trying and, 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 and testing the, the limits of this approach. I, I think, in fact, that from, from a normative point of view, it's almost more important to try it in a divided country because you really need, from, from a justice point of view, that's where you need to hear the, all the voices even more. So, so then feasibility constraints should be secondary. Um, and then uh, there are big theoretical questions of uh, you know, um, trade-offs to be made between openness, representativeness, and transparency, and, and other values. So I'll stop there. Oh, 
Hello? Uh, ah. uh, well, hello, I'm Nicolas Mar. Um, with Ernesto, we are part of La Constitución de Todos, the, the Everybody's Constitution. Oh, um, okay. It was, I don't know if you have heard of it, but no. uh, it was a replication uh, about what happened in Morocco uh, uh, some years ago in a constitutional process uh, yeah. in the middle of the Arab Spring. In 2011, yes. Um, uh, I don't know, but uh, to us, it seems like uh, you that the Iceland case, uh, it's a very good case about how uh, the crowdsourcing process can happen in a, in a institutional level. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we wonder how do you see about a process that uh, sometimes has a more base uh, start, like the Morocco case, where uh, a group of citizens uh, start a crowdsourcing process yeah. uh, in response to the situation, the global situation that it's, ha it's happening in their own country. Uh, we start a process in a similar way a um, few, few years before it happened here in Chile. Uh, with the with the government idea of uh, institutional change, and well, we have our, <laughs> our results about that. But how do you see that? How do you see the possibility that the crowdsourcing process happen in a base case? It starts a base case and end as an institutional case. Um, I don't know. That's it's about my question. Okay, I'm just ready. So just more. First of all, there is a fact that has come out since we were so exposed to the Icelandic experiment, and that's the 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 size. No, 230,000. Sorry? 235,000. 235,000. 235,000. Okay. Okay. No, no one explained me those two methods. I don't know if you're a citizen. And that leads me to that distinction uh, about uh, micro audiences and micro audiences. Uh, I think there is uh, something like consensus that uh, deliberative democracy, descriptive democracy, I mean, all these, uh, uh, I don't want to say artifacts, but all these you know, institutional arrangements that imply uh, very, very high levels of participation, very, very high levels of deliberation, and finally, decisions that are almost consensual in terms of the whole body, you know, members of the, of the audience in question. Mm -hmm. uh, well, collecting intelligence, intelligence and, and, and the rationality that one can uh, sort of impute to uh, uh, the liberty to democracy, very high levels of participation, the archaeologists, uh, 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 adjectives, etc. I mean, it's rules of the game. Uh, that works well with uh, micro uh, You know, it's the, the famous romantic image of Dr. Hill with respect to the, the, the 
town councils in the United States. Uh, okay, and I think that collective intelligence and also sort of strange concepts, I mean, contemporary strange concepts. I mean, when I started to read the songs, no one was more of collective intelligence. Yeah. Um, makes sense, but makes sense to be that domain, the domain of, I, I could say, just yes, micro audiences, but audiences that are known from a rather small size. There is, I think, uh, a challenge there, you know, for the emissions of numbers. I mean, What is the micro audience? I mean, how large can micro audience be? Um, well, first that. Secondly, uh, I have the impression that uh, all this new, you know, uh, vision of constitution making, it's not constitution making really in the vision, it's uh, the process of constitution the revolution, something like that, of the constitution and the birth I mean, from you know, the, the bottom line. You know. um, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to it, but at the same time, one has to remember that first, you know, constitutions by their essence, in the case of this, but uh, constitutions uh, traditionally are in charge you know, of the structure, the political institution and architecture of, of the country. And that has to do with all classical themes like uh, separation of powers, uh, municipal authority, and so on. And those are really, those are really, you know, Macro, macro issues. I mean, uh, it's difficult to think of them. Let's say, even in, in, in a society like the China, when there is, uh, there is like 17 million, 17, 18 million uh, people, you know, even, I mean, it's not very large, but uh, even, even for this population, it's very difficult to think of a uh, Obtaining a legitimate uh, uh, political institutional architecture, macro political institutional architecture, uh, um, I mean, through the institutional making process, like uh, these ones that we are sympathetic to. Um, so, first that, thirdly, remember, you know, uh, uh, the decisions that I have to think of them, like uh, Carl Schmidt, I mean, finally, uh, the Constitution is the product of, of the correlation of bosses. We have explained why, finally, we have. Says this is about the executive process. Well, it's not only me. Why don't you ask it? Who's not a who's not a fascist? It's <laughs> because um, that's this, uh, you know, a, a, a very uh, a neat model about. Uh, Political equilibrium, but finally, you know, constitution is legitimate in a sense of reflects you know, political equilibrium that can last for a long period. Um, so, I mean, again, uh, I think it's a very interesting, uh, but I think that it has, it, it's, it's, it, it will be much more fruitful applied to. The local domains, uh, regional domains, uh, local governments, uh, 
local administration and so on. I mean, perhaps there is a link there with decentralization, which is another right so long as now, it is put it that way. And there, again, I will finish. Uh, I am, you know, sort of skeptic, skeptical. Um, finally, decentralization, is it really, you know, a, 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 a real tool that has no, you know, uh, negative dimensions? Are they not uh, local elites? Uh, 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 or I think they uh, can also start uh, also you know, the object of process of concentration in the local level. In the past it was so. Centralization was finally you know, a sort of liberating process since the French Revolution onwards. You know. uh, Probably in Chile in uh, 1900, uh, uh, perhaps a comparative, uh, perhaps a historical study will show that uh, uh, decentralization was uh, much more, you know, uh, significant than now. But, the concept of the concept is you know, in terms of exploring this uh, this issue. Well, sorry, I didn't want to do that. Oh, yeah. So the last, there was another question over there? Hi, uh, my name is Pamela Figueroa. Thank you, Helen, for your interesting presentation. And I want to ask you about the political factor. You just talk about the political factor in the conclusion. Um, last year we have here Salvor Nordel, who was oh, the she president. Came yeah, she came okay. here. We invited to present a report that OECD made about the participatory process in Chile of the constitution building process. Um, I think that uh, she, she talks about the political factor uh, as the very important factor for the failure of the process. Yeah. For, for the what? For the failure of the yeah. process, yeah. Because as, as you explained, they have a process very specific with a, a, a citizen council with some participation through the internet and so on. But they they have uh, some some problems with the political system because all the all the process. As you know, here in Chile, we, 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 ha we, we are in the constitutional building process with a very innovative participatory method. But uh, always is difficult, you know, when, when you want to innovate in democratic me mechanisms in, in a system with lack of legitimacy from the political parties, government, authorities, all the institutions, yeah? to combine um, the, the new practices, the new methods, with a, a political system that needs also some change. So how do you see that? How do uh, you have think about that? You have, you know, some views? Thank you. Great, wow. Um, okay. Can I try so, that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, so to the first question, what about grassroots movement that try to crowdsource a constitution? Uh, so I don't really know the Moroccan case. I, I'd be interested in looking into it. Um, so I think it's it's an interesting exercise. But like, in order for this to to 
be an inspiration. It would have to go beyond the crowdsourcing phase because you cannot let just whoever wants to write a constitution write it on a website. I mean, this is just not going to be representative of the larger population, right? So it's an interesting exercise. It can serve as an input, and I, I, and I think, you know, it's been tried in, you know, I think you know, by a group of academics in the UK, et cetera, but it's never going to have any legitimacy in the eyes of the rest of the population because it's not structured to represent... Um, all of them, right? Maybe it does represent some of them, maybe most of them, but like, I think it needs to be embedded in a structure where everyone can recognize that they are part of it. And and I see, so what you're describing, I see it as the beginning of something, but it, it cannot be, it cannot be the whole thing, right? Um, so it's kind of like the disparate solution when you're at a point where there's no institutions left, maybe, you know, if you're on the deserted island and or like everything's collapsed, then that maybe that's the only option. But in Iceland, mercifully, they had a bloodless revolution and that preserved the continuity of the government and the nation and the state. So it, it was not like a, a founding moment. Um, you know, the Americans had a sort of founding moment that way where, where frankly, the, the, the Philadelphia Convention was, was, was borderline illegal. It took it upon itself to start a new political order, even though it had been only charged with amending Confederation articles. So very tricky, right? And I think you want to avoid, if you can, this sort of revolutionary moments because it can go very, very wrong. Then again, Morocco, maybe maybe that's, that's desperate and that you need that. I do not know and I'm definitely not going to recommend anything one way or the other because this would be irresponsible. Uh, so that's what I have to say. Um, on the other hand, just one more thing. The problem when you depend on a, on a pre-existing order and a top-down structure is that basically the final say is in the hands of that structure, which is why the Icelandic process failed, because in the end, there was this one last uh, gateway, gatekeeper, the parliament, who just turned off the process, right? And even, in fact, in the Icelandic case, even if that parliament had said, okay, we vote for that constitution, uh, they would have had to dissolve immediately as a parliament, have another election, bring to power another parliament, which itself would have had to say, okay, this is a new constitution. So the hurdles to that process, to that, to that proposal, this constitution proposal, were enormous. So, so then the temptation is revolution or doing it outside the existing structures. But I, I do think it's, it's got to be a last resort sort of thing. Uh, you know, I'm, I think I'm more of a reformist that way. So. Um, then uh, the objection of size. So I think I addressed it partly in my talk. I, I, I know it's a small country. Uh, on the other hand, none of the innovations I've mentioned uh, cannot, can, can, are, are impossible to scale, right? You can scale them all. You can, the, the randomly selected public, it's not a form of direct participation that can only happen in a small country. You can do it in a large country. The crowdsourcing, as I said, you can do it in a large country. You just have to have the right technology and the, the, the sort of right framework for it. The referendum, we do it all the time in all, all kinds of nations at any kind of size, except the U.S. actually, where there are virtually none. Um, and, and there's no consensus technically required. It's true that the, the Council of 25 made their decisions by consensus, but they did that because they knew that if they, if they didn't, Parliament would use it as an excuse against them to say, oh, look, they were a divided group. They couldn't agree on anything. Why are we listening to them? But you could decide to, 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 to reach conclusions by a bare majority if, you're, if, it's, if it's such a bitter controversy. And it would still have democratic legitimacy, better than letting a minority decide. So I, it, I'm not talking about uh, direct democracy. I'm talking about a representative, very mediated form of democracy, which can happen at any scale. For me, the size is really not, uh, it's true it happened in a small country, but I don't think it, uh, it was feasible just because the country was small. I think uh, the, 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 more, the greater problem is perhaps the homogeneity. For that one, I have no certainty, but for the size, I'm pretty sure it's um, largely irrelevant. And your question about how large can a micro audience be? That's interesting, actually. I've asked myself this question many times. I think a micro audience is maybe 25 people. And beyond that, you have to resort to maybe a bit more. But, but when you're talking about a nation of 235,000 people, you're already beyond the micro audience. It's already large enough that we can't talk to all of, of, it, of, of us. So between 235 and 20 million, 
you know, you're going to have to use representative uh, uh, bodies, and those scale because they're designed to scale. So I, I I'm not, I, I understand the, the, the suspicion, but I don't, the logic, um, in my view, of that argument fails. Um, uh, the conflict. Well, you know, I think that we're going to have a fundamental disagreement about what politics is about. I mean, people like Zhivorsky and all the, you know, Schumpeterian Democrats think that politics is fundamentally about competition and fundamentally about competing interests. That's one vision of politics. You can also have a vision of politics where it's fundamentally about uh, trying to solve problems. And there we need to, uh, you know, once we also sort out some, some fundamental interest uh, differences procedurally, we also have to find common grounds, common solutions, and speak a, a shared language, and work towards, towards common solutions. So if you emphasize that instead of the pure conflict of interest, then deliberation becomes a very, very much a necessary tool uh, because you create synergies and, and, and a, a dynamic of arguments where you, you have a hope of achieving something that works for everyone in some way. Whereas if you, if you stick to this agonistic logic of pure conflict, um, well, you're stuck with the party system and the sort of, uh, you know, competitive system, for example, that we have in the US where people don't talk to each other, there's no cross-ideological exchange, and I don't think it, it's, a, it's, a demonst it, it's, it's a great system. I don't think it works fantastically, you know? So then the, the answer from the realist camp that I, I, I suspect you're, you're, you're favorable to is to say, well, that's the best you can hope of democracy. Democracy, you, you, you're, you have unrealistic expectations about what it can give you. The best it can give you is a sort of like conflict management and constant frustration, but it's worse. It's, it's better than the alternative, and that's that's what you. I refuse to settle for that. I think we can do better. I think uh, the Greeks did better, and we can reinvent something, you know, even better. It's a matter of trying. And Icelanders are showing the way. They've they've gone, you know, this far, and then they failed. Although we don't know because it's still um, up for discussion right now. You know. Uh, one day they might pass this proposal, or they might go for an amendment. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't just say they failed yet. You know, give, give them some time. But they, they definitely failed in the first round. But it's a, it's the first time in history. How long did it take before France got a true democracy? You know, 1789. So many false starts. So, just not ready to to, to settle for for what we have yet. Uh, then uh, the. Decentralization, I didn't talk about decentralization, so I'm, I, I'm agnostic on that. Um, and the concept of, and the Carl Schmitt thing, I, I don't think Carl Schmitt is, a, is, a, is an authority on, on, for me. <laughs> so I, 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 that's not where I take my, uh, my arguments from. And, and um, so I, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Um, so the political factor uh, in Iceland, no, I, I think it's, it's it's a problem. They started with a very uh, purist vision of the process, excluding politicians, doing things apart from them in their bubble, the, the Council of 25. And again, I think you need to build allies, to, to, to cultivate allies in government, because they had some initially, you know. Uh, keep a bridge. If you're going to do this from within an existing structure, as they did, they, they were not a, a breakaway convention. They were not a, you know, starting from scratch. Then you need to do it in in a, in a collaboration with the existing system. This, this otherwise you're going to lose legitimacy. You're going to lose support, and you're going to lose. Period. I think a better example of the way it was uh, something like that was attempted and succeeded was Ireland. In 2012, Ireland also had a constitutional reform. They didn't re reform the whole thing. Right, they, they didn't go for like the most ambitious goal. They went. They, they just said, okay, our constitution is old. It's dated. It has some problems. One of them is uh, homosexuality is a crime. In 2012, in Ireland, homo homosexuality was a crime. You could go to jail. I mean, really. So, so they said, okay, we need to like change that. Um, so they created a constitutional convention where they put uh, 100 members. 66 were selected at random, 33 were elected officials, and one was an elected official who was a chair. So instead of 
you know, of having oh the elected world out there and the randomly selected uh, mini public here or the ordinary citizens here, they, they brought those two worlds together and they built the trust. And the elected officials were surprised to actually, you know, encounter thoughtful citizens who invested a lot of time and energy in thinking about issues and were totally capable of holding their ground on, 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 on complex moral issues, complex political issues. Conversely, the, the citizens were pleased to see that, you know, there were some elected officials who were capable of listening, not be condescending, engage in a productive discussion. So they managed to pass an, an amendment on uh, decriminalizing um, homosexuality and indeed, in fact, uh, pass uh, gay marriage equality, you know, gay marriage uh, law. So pure, from a purely theoretical point of view, it's a less pure model because there's a conflict of legitimacy in a way between the elected officials and the randomly selected one. But the reality is that in practice, if you care about the successful political aspect of this, it works better when you bring bring people together. And then the question is, okay, why 66 versus 33? You know, it, it, who knows? Um, could be 50-50. There are like empirical questions that can be solved. And so, but, but the more we try those new forms of uh, making decisions and changing things, the more we learn. We learn whether it works at scale. We learn whether it works among divided countries. We learn what proportion is, is best, you know? We, we learn all sorts of things. But we have to try them first, so. Okay, so we can have a second round. This was really good because we had civil society, scholarly world, and the government, so. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Helen. Thanks for your presentation. My question is about. Um, Would you mind to introduce yourself? So. Oh, my name is Felipe Correa. I'm a researcher from ICLAC UN. We are we are neighbors. <laughs> And my question is about um, why randomly selected people. So is there an issue with with the fact that maybe people doesn't know how to choose or doesn't choose well so we we can trust more in randomly selected people than in people that is selected by the yeah. by the people yeah. is Great. is yeah. it's funny i don't i don't know Eh, hola, buenos días. Mi nombre es Matías Silva. Eh, vengo de la Universidad Alberto Hurtado, miembro de Marca C. Y, eh, Are you going to make the question in, in Spanish? In Spanish, okay. yes. Y coordinador de eh, la Comisión de Contenidos Constitucionales de Revolución Democrática. Eh, la pregunta que quiero hacer es que eh, todo proceso constituyente implica además eh, un proceso de carácter político. Espera, bueno, haz todo de nuevo y voy a anotar, voy a anotar la pregunta para traducírsela después. Dale, de nuevo, despacito. despacito. Suave, suavecito. <risa> Matías Silva. Pues como Luis Fonsi entonces. Eh, todo proceso constituyente implica un proceso de carácter político. ¿ya? Ese proceso de carácter político se traduce en un conflicto entre dos grandes fuerzas, podemos decir. Las fuerzas conservadoras que no quieren avanzar hacia una nueva constitución y podemos decir las fuerzas progresistas que sí quieren avanzar hacia una nueva constitución. ¿ya? Eh, en ese sentido, me parece que la exposición que hace la profesora eh, dice relación con eh, una, una exposición metodológica acerca del proceso constituyente irlandés. ¿no? Y eh, que desde el punto de vista de, de por qué falla ese proceso, se vincula también ¿no? con nuestro proceso constituyente. ¿no? Eh, nuestro proceso constituyente está asociado también a un proceso de carácter político donde entran en conflicto estas dos grandes fuerzas. Eh, 
cuando hablo de fuerzas conservadoras no quiero aquí estigmatizar a un sector político, me parece que las fuerzas conservadoras en el proceso constituyente chileno no están solamente en la derecha, están en la derecha, están en quienes forman parte del gobierno de la nueva mayoría y eh, aquí hago una autocrítica también y están también en las fuerzas que forman parte del Frente Amplio. Eh, desde, esa, desde esa perspectiva eh, me gustaría que, eh, que la profesora se extendiera también en ese factor político ¿ya? que involucra ¿ya? un proceso constituyente. Eh, yo creo que eh, si uno compara el proceso constituyente islandés con el proceso constituyente ch eh, chileno, tienen bastantes semejanzas. Eh, tienen semejanzas porque eh, acá hay alguien que empuja también un, un proceso constituyente que es la ciudadanía, eso se da en el proceso islandés, se da en el proceso constituyente chileno si uno lo analiza desde el 2009, 2011, y luego con la presidenta que eh, incluye dentro de su programa político una nueva constitución sin señalar, sin señalar mecanismo. Eh, y cómo estas fuerzas conservadoras, que en el caso chileno están en estos tres, ya, eh, podemos decir, eh, eh, factores políticos, ya, eh, han influido también en que este proceso constituyente, que yo considero es progresista, no logra avanzar. Muchas gracias. Okay. Ya tenemos tres, ¿no? ¿no? No, no, no. Este es el segundo. Ok. Uh, I want to know from your studies also what it's, you know, the world is changing a lot. So, The citizens, we haven't been um, deciding a lot in the last centuries, you know. So we are not used to um, to deliberate together. So this concept about the micro democracy or um, macro democracy, as Angel pointed out, you know, might be that we are not pumped or not empowered as citizens who are used to giving all the responsibility to a small group of citizens. And can this change over time? Because this is the first intent, you know, on changing the constitution. So probably the amount of people who participated can be more and, and I mean can be bigger and bigger as people understand that we can change things, you know, over time. The first question about why random selection. Um, uh, no. Okay. That, never mind. So, so, so why uh, randomly selected mini publics? So, rather than. So it's not that people don't know how to elect, but it's, it's that the, the, pr the principle of election itself might be the problem in the sense that it is an oligarchic selection mechanism, right? The Greeks didn't have it for a reason, which is that it selected the sort of most visible, most powerful um, char characters, and that had some problem they were very much aware of, so they kept those functions for very specific things, like the generals, where you want some somebody with, you know, striking characteristics and but for for an assembly for example which is supposed to think about what should be in the social contract that binds us all it's not clear that you want elite people it's not clear that you want uh the ones that are most likely to be elected because they happen to be charismatic visible noted in the in the society especially because if the society is not equal to begin with we already know that it's always going to be the same people who are chosen So even assuming that, you know, very optimistic, uh, even assuming that the best case scenario that elections do select for the most, the, the smartest and the most virtuous, which was, you know, Madison's assumption, right? We would select the natural aristocracy of the people, which I don't think is true. I don't think that's what elections select. 
<laughs> but let, let's assume that's the case. You still have a conceptual problem, which is that it's not clear that in order to have the best assembly you can to track the common good, the best strategy is to staff it with the smartest people. Turns out, and that's, that's my previous work, previous book on, on collective intelligence, there are reasons to think that in order to get the best assembly that is going to track the common good, you are better off focusing on a group property rather than individual properties. So if I had my PowerPoint, I would show you because maybe it's not so easy to communicate, but uh, it's okay. I'll just try to explain it. So the idea is that, um, and I understand that our intuition from the 18th century onward is that to, in order to have a group of 10 people that are like as a group super smart, you have to add one plus one plus one plus one plus one, plus one 10 people that are super smart. So that it's not true. Um, if they're going to deliberate and pro solve problems together, you're better off with a group of people that are less smart as individuals, but think differently. Because if they think differently, they're not going to be stuck on the same solutions because they tend to think in the same molds, being trained or you know in the same schools or coming from the same sort of uh, sectors of society or something. So it's it's the idea of like being able to climb to, to guide each other to the global optimum of a given sort of epistemic landscape, as opposed to having you know perfect exploration of just one peak that's suboptimal. So anyway, that's the intuition. So. What you get with random selection is a full exploration of all the whole diversity that exists in the country. Even as you're gonna get an averagely intelligent assembly because it will just you know, get the average IQ out there. So if you switch, if you shift your, your, your uh, mental paradigm of what makes for a good assembly from, uh, from, oh, let's add up all the smart individuals to how do we focus on getting enough individual competence, but also enough diversity of perspectives, then you start looking at election in a different way. And you start seeing the benefits of, of, of random selection, because for sure you're going to get a lot of diversity there. So it's a trade-off, you know? You're going to get less individual, uh, less competent individuals, maybe, along one dimension, because also, what do we know about what makes a competent individuals? We have very specific assumptions. It's people with a PhD, it's people who look a certain way, it's people who speak a certain way, with a certain accent, uh, and might not even track actual intelligence, right? So I think it's much easier to maximize diversity of the group through pure random selection than to maximize average competence. Because we get fooled by all sorts of things. Again, social prejudices, you know, if you're a white, uh, educated older man with a British accent, you come across as smarter than if you're a you know, tiny, shy, black woman. That's just a fact. And it's so, so we make all sorts of cognitive mistakes, and, and random selection equalizes the, 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 the field that way. Another advantage of random selection, so that's my argument for it, but there are many arguments which are that, well, that embodies the principle of equality in a way that election doesn't. Like, we all have an equal chance of accessing power. Whereas for elections, again, you know, our chances of, uh, the chance of, of the ordinary citizens to ever be elected is, is quasi-null. In existing representative democracy, it's quasi-null. Even in an ideal elected electoral representative democracy, it would be probably be very low. So you might say, well, I mean, if you're one in a million, uh, the, your chances of being selected for a mini public are also very low. That is true, and that is a problem. So you would want, that's why I think it's not enough to have just one randomly selected assembly. You would want to multiply them at different levels of the polity so that we get socialized, first of all, into this kind of like uh, jury duty, after all. You know, That's the same concept as a jury, except bigger, and for other functions than, than uh, uh, making a judgment in a, in a in a, in a uh, judicial system. So, so that's it. So actually, so that helped me um, answer your question, um, Alejandra, about are people ready to take on those deliberative functions? They've never been trusted. They don't know how to do it. Do they even know how to deliberate? 
I agree with you, it's a problem. And I can tell you that coming from France, where people don't know how to deliberate, they just shout at each other and they just get very judgmental and the conversation becomes very heated quickly. Deliberation is, is, a, is a technology that we need to learn to, to use. Uh, it demands that you're ready to listen carefully to your opponent, even if it makes your blood boil. You know, you have to resist the temptation to insult, to, to cut off the conversation, to like find a sneaky way to like prove them wrong. You just have to, yeah. So I think part of the conceptual shift is also the, the, the mental shift. We, we have to change our, our, our attitudes towards uh, disagreement not, and, and become comfortable with disagreement. And none of us are. Disagreement is painful. Uh, that's why in, in deliberative settings that work, you usually have fa trained facilitators who are there to basically remind you of the parameters of the conversation that, that you know you have to be respectful, um, you have to, to listen, you, you can't uh, uh, you know uh, manipulate the, the conversation to your advantage. You know there are a lot of principles that need to get. So deliberation is not something that will happen spontaneously, especially in cultures that have a history of like bitter you know resentment with certain you know. Political conflicts. I mean, I mean, I think France is, is like that. You know, it's very hard to, to talk across uh, uh, political divides. In the U.S., it's different. People are very polite, but they don't talk about politics. So they, they solve it that way. Um, so we're, we're just at the beginning of understanding how to use deliberation in productive ways. And, and but if we don't start, we'll never learn. So we have to train children. So, for example, one thing that that really was a shock to me when I when I came from France to the U.S. that in seminars. People were incredibly respectful of each other's views in a way that I just, you know, like in France, you just get shut down. It's not in the culture to value disagreement. So I think, you know, it happens in small seminars, in the elite uh, Ivy school, etc. But I think there's a way we should have a, um, entire educational systems with thoughts to value that. And one way to value that is to explain that, look, we all benefit from the disagreement and the diversity. This, the same way that we, we know the group is smarter if it includes different people who think differently, but if it makes it very costly to talk because then you have to process all sorts of ideas that are uncomfortable and and hard to understand. And But if you in integrate those values of, of uh, appreciating the contribution of disagreement and, and, uh, and difference into a curriculum, then, then students behave very differently. You learn that you're not, you know, you you cannot capture the whole of what there is to capture. That even somebody, I mean, it's, it's all I, an old idea of an in, in John Stuart Mill, right? You, you, your truths become dead dogmas if they're not constantly challenged. And I think that's so. so what I'm saying is just an extension of that in a way. Like you, you, you have you have to build a society where we know that we have to be epistemically humble, and and willing to open up and listen to other views. So that's, that's like my answer to this. And then, the, um, I, I don't really know the situation in Chile. So if you're asking me to compare Iceland and Chile, I, I won't be able to. Uh, I suspect it's not, uh, people have this idealized vision of Iceland as this wonderful country where everybody gets along and it's so consensual. And no, no, it's not like that at all. I mean, to me, disagreement among human beings is fractal. Everywhere you turn, the smaller scale, the larger scale, it's there. Um, they disagreed bitterly about the status of the evangelical Lutheran church. They disagreed bitterly about, um, uh, well, economic policies. You know, you have extremely liberal people there who want, you know, free trade, no regulations. Let's go back to the crazy days of uh, over-investing and, and, you know, they, they think it was just a temporary glitch and, you know, we should repeat. Then you have the classical socialists who prefer more regulation. So they, they have these conflicts as well. And, um, the thing is, parties who are supposed to represent these, these, these conflicts, I'm, I'm not sure they represent actual disagreements in the population or things that have uh, crystallized and have become disconnected from the rest of the population. So if you look at France, for example, we have this Macron movement, which refused to be called a party for a while. It won because precisely it cut through the classical polarization that had become completely disconnected from what people actually wanted. Um, and so maybe a mini public of randomly selected citizens is not the solution because apparently Macron managed to do it without that. He managed to feminize um, uh, 
and, and render much younger the, the parliament without a mini public, without random selection. So you can do it without that. But the, 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 yeah, so, so I, I, don't have, I don't have a good answer. I, I'm just seeing these trends, and I, and I think they, they, apply, they seem to apply to me everywhere, not just to Iceland or Chile or France. If you could talk to the mic so yeah. that people can hear you. Just a very brief mic. remark. Uh, I would like to remember that uh, random uh, selection is a mechanism of uh, equalization since Athens, at least, yeah. perhaps since before. So, uh, I mean, there is nothing extraordinary in that. And I would say, secondly, that it's not at all, you know, uh, at least in terms of, uh, of notions like uh, collective intelligence and uh, all the experiments of social psychology that we conduct in terms of uh, collective intelligence. It's not, you know, uh, a, a sort of uh, irrational or anti-rational uh, 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 Artifact I mean, in, in its application, uh, as you say, really. mm -hmm. uh, heterogeneity is uh, really a, a, a precondition, you know, of uh, uh, rational decisions, and uh, if you don't have something like uh, the, the a random uh, selection of positions of people to, to positions. Well, I I mean, history, common sense, whatever you know, shows that uh, teaches that uh, uh, you will not have the technology. I mean, uh, of course, uh, the ability to some kind of uh, uh, social groups. You know, so, uh, I think that uh, random selection is uh, extremely defensive. Great. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I completely agree, and I'm glad you, you mentioned ancient Greece. It's, it, it, it's, oh, you want another question? Uh, Gonzalo wants to. I think we, we should close with this, uh, with your. In with your last, the last question to the, go ahead. Gracias. Helen, I have two questions for you. One um, is, okay, what's happened after we have a new constitution? So we are discussing on more democratic methods for the uh, construction of a new constitution, but what of these methodologies should we aim to also include in the, let's say, permanent system? Ah, uh, in the constitution itself, in, yeah. Uh-huh, uh -huh. for, for the process of um, lawmaking, yeah? yeah. Um, so it's a question that's related a bit to how do we improve our model for living in a democracy. And the second question is, what are the questions that you would like to ask uh, to the Chilean people about our constitutional processes? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Can I answer now? Yes. Yeah, okay, sorry. No, so I can only, I totally agree with you. And um, I just wanted to mention, to add something to your point about ancient Athens, that what's interesting to me is that Ancient Athens had a selection by lots because for the, you know, they were really a small group. I mean, they, they, they were able to um, do it manually. Like they had this clerotarian that Jim Fishkin was talking about where they, you know, they put a little piece of wood and then they were selected. So it was a lottery. Uh, everybody got, got a token. And, um, but then when in the 18th century people thought back to that model, they were like, well, we just don't have the technology. Like we can't do it on a mass scale in the millions. So the only thing that the anti-federalists were in favor of a sort of mirror representations uh, of the assembly that was supposed to look like the people on the model of the Council of 500 in ancient Athens, 
they just they just didn't have a solution so they thought okay well so we have to use elections because that's the only thing that we can use so let's make the constituency smaller so that way when we select people from a smaller constituency at least we won't get a representative sample but we won't get just to just to rich and powerful we'll get you know middle class people in power but that just like wasn't as co conceptually coherent as the federal solution which was Let's use elections to select the wisest and the smartest. That, that's perfectly coherent. Your, your mean matches your end. So the anti-federalist lost for all sorts of reasons. But now we have, so a, a century later, statistics became a science. Became, so, so we started having the tools to understand uh, how you can create a random sample of, of the entire population. So, so I think now in the 21st century, we, we could go back to uh, a Greek model in some respect, with the right tools, with a match between our means and our ends, and uh, so so that's why it's, it's not only rational; it's actually feasible, um, and already done around the world actually. So Thomas' question about what happens after we have a constitution, excellent question. So I'll just I, I'm not going to tell you what you guys should do, but I'll tell you what the Icelanders did. Um, so. Experts have evaluated the constitutional proposal and they've said it's one of the most inclusive and uh, participatory constitutional proposal in, in the world, not in terms of the process, but in terms of the content. They've assessed the content. Why? Because they have two things in particular that really change the nature of, a, of, the, of, a, of the system. They have a citizen's initiative and a citizen's referral. So a citizen's initiative is, uh, you may be familiar because in California they have something called the ballot initiative, which is a terrible thing that you shouldn't copy, <laughs> uh, but it's somewhat similar. It's called a citizen's initiative because if a uh, uh, sufficient number of, of uh, uh, citizens have an idea about a law proposal, they have the option of gathering signatures and if they reach the threshold to put it on the agenda of the legislature which is a much more direct way to affect policy making and law making than having to choose a candidate who has it, who may or, or may not offer something similar on this, on this platform and just the option of saying yes or no to this platform. So like directly accessing the agenda of the <coughs> legislature. And it's not as dangerous as the version they have in California because um, you don't, you, it's not enough to have signature. There needs to be a deliberative process so the, the parliament has to deliberate and either come up um, with a counter proposal if they, if they don't think it's a good idea, or, or indeed put it to a vote. But, but there's got to be some deliberation and some room for negotiation and back and forth between the public, who may have great ideas but not really necessarily well put, and the parliament, who can really cr have a useful role of like shaping and, 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 and um, transforming the proposal, but has an obligation to, one, debate it, and if the threshold is high enough, to either put it to a vote or, um, or, or offer a counter-proposal, that's better. Um, then there's a so-called citizen's referral that they also put in their, in their constitution. It's a possibility, so it's more of a negative tool. It's not a constructive tool. It's when parliament has passed a law uh, and it turns out it doesn't work in practice or it has terrible effects or just people think it's, I don't know, not working as intended or not good. They again can reach a number of signatures where they can say, look, we, we, we hate this law. We would like a referendum on the law. And then you get a referendum, and then you, you give a chance of the, to the people to correct quickly for that problem, or keep the law if it turns out it works. And I'll just give you the example of Finland in uh, that in 2012 had a first citizens initiative that was passed. So they allowed citizens to gather signatures on a public platform and put proposals to parliament. So the first proposal that was put to parliament was a ban on fur farm in Northern Ireland, where they kill foxes and all kinds of like furry animals for, for, for sale, um, for the sale of the skins. And some act, right, animal uh, rights activists said, it's too cruel, we should stop this. So this was put to parliament, they had a debate about it, and they said, well, maybe, but you know, um, we need the money, kind of, it's an economic necessity, we keep it. So this was ignored. Then there were 400 more proposals that, that were debated, never made it. Finally, there was a proposal on marriage equality, which had been a big issue in the country, but the parties just couldn't agree. There was you know, just too many uh, friction around that issue. But the fact that it came from the people allowed the, the members of parliament to like, drop their ideological pretenses and vote their 
conviction, and so it passed immediately. So now Finland has marriage equality. And you might say, well, it's Finland. They, they would have had it in 10 years, 15 years. But for people, it makes a huge difference that it passed 10 years earlier, or maybe 20 years earlier. So it's an example. And uh, so these are the two things that they have in the constitution that, that's really innovative. Uh, they also have made the constitution more easily amendable than it is currently. Currently, it's very hard to amend this, the, the Icelandic constitution because you have to have two successive parliaments um, approving a change with supermajoritarian super thresholds. So basically, it's dooming any kind of change. Uh, same thing in, in the US, like the possibility of a constitutional change is just implausible because the process to change is, is just not, we've learned that it cannot be, it's a threshold that cannot be met. So, so the Icelanders made sure that they could revise their constitution uh, more easily. So these are like three examples of things you could do. Uh, you could. Um, so Jim Fishkin was talking about how Mongolia, uh, I didn't quite, I'm not sure if I understood what he said correctly, but he has convinced Mongol, the Mongolian government to um, make it a law, maybe not a constitutional law, but make it a law that any constitutional amendment or any referendum on anything has to be preceded by a deliberative poll. It's, 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 it's in a way to perhaps avoid things like Brexit, where people go to the vote uh, not having gone first through a process of like informed deliberation with each other and only they have, they've only been exposed to the propaganda of one side or the other and so that's that's that you could do that as well yeah okay i think we need to close the the conference i want to thank again professor landemore for being with us and plaxo chile tribu and Congreso del Futuro for making this possible and to all of you who came. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>